Hello and welcome to Just Have A Think. If you've been watching the channel from the start, you'll know I set up a board of words to follow up, which I call the WTF board. The board has definitely helped me address quite a few areas of my own ignorance over the past few programs, but one subject is still on there that I know very little about, and that subject is El Nino. It looks like now's a good time to find out all about it, because apparently there's a 70% chance we're going to get one this winter. Over here in the UK, we're not particularly well schooled in this phenomenon, so this week I've been looking at what it is, why it happens, and what it does. Wikipedia tells us that El Nino is the warm phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, commonly known as ENSO, and is associated with a band of warm ocean water that develops in the central and east central equatorial Pacific. So what does that mean? Well, let's get this thing fired up again and we can have a look at the planet. Now, one thing that always amazes me when I have a look at it is the truly astonishing size of the Pacific Ocean. If you turn the globe around carefully enough, you can lose just about all the landmass, and all you can see is the sea. It's like half the globe. Now, it turns out that it's across the mid latitudes of the Pacific Ocean that we get what they call the trade winds. Remember the Aneedon line from the 70s? Oh, days of innocence, the 70s. Mostly. Sorry. Anyway, they were called the trade winds because they swept the clipper ships rapidly across from the west coast of South America to the east coast of Asia. Now, here comes a sciencey bit. These winds are actually so strong that they physically push the top few feet of water across the surface of the ocean, with the result that the sea level on the Asian side is about half a metre higher than the sea level on the South American side. And that top few feet of water is warm water because of course it's getting all the warmth from the sun. And as it constantly moves across, it causes deeper, colder water to move up to take its place. So the science bods call this upwelling. And what happens in normal circumstances is that the warm, moist air rises very high on the Asian side causing the unsettled weather and rainfall that the region sees each year. And that high level warm air then returns across the Pacific back down to the lower, cooler east side, and this perpetuates the trade winds. It's just one great big conveyor belt of weather joy. But every now and again, somewhere between every two and seven years, the trade winds weaken significantly so this transfers all the warm water back to this side of the Pacific. Generally, this phenomenon gets to its strongest level with the warmest seas on the coast of Peru around Christmas. And that's why the Peruvian fishermen of yesteryear called it the Christ Child, or El Nino, which quite frankly is about as daft and tenuous a reason for naming anything as I can think of. But whatever, it's called El Nino and that's just the way it is. So, why is El Nino apparently so impactful on the ecosystem of our planet? That movement of warm water back to the east side of the Pacific carries with it a quite mind-boggling amount of energy. The record El Nino that happened back in 1997 transferred an amount of energy equivalent to 100 times the energy use of the entire human species in an entire year, which for you technically minded folks is 35 million million billion joules of energy, which is a lot. And that changes the weather systems profoundly, not just in South America and Asia, but potentially all over the world. In 1998, rain and mudslides in California and Peru killed dozens of people and left thousands more without homes. There was freak rainfall in Kenya that year as well, about 100 centimetres more than normal. And Hurricane Pauline delivered 90 centimetres of rain to Western Mexico in one day. Whilst on the other side of the Pacific, Indonesia experienced extreme droughts. As well as causing extra chaos in the weather system of the world, all that energy can also contribute to a general increase in the temperature of the planet in an El Nino year. According to the website Climate Signals, there's growing evidence that the accelerating climate change that we're now witnessing is also increasing the risk of more extreme El Nino events. Now this model shows the Pacific temperature changes as El Nino developed during 2016, the year which at least at the moment remains the hottest on record. According to the UN, 
The 2016 El Nino impacted 100 million people worldwide, as well as causing permanent damage to coral reefs and an upsurge in carbon dioxide emissions from all the forest fires that happened that year. Ethiopia suffered its worst drought in decades with 1.3 million adults and children displaced from their homes and 8.5 million Ethiopians are reckoned to be still relying on emergency aid today. Now, in the interest of fairness and balance, it's also true to say that El Nino predictions this early in the annual weather cycle are apparently notoriously fickle. So the 70-30 odds I talked about at the start of the program might change as we approach the last quarter of 2018. But initial indications are suggesting that if an El Nino does develop this December, then 2019 stands a very good chance of knocking 2016 off the perch as the hottest year on record. Back in November 2016, the United Nations Environment Programme, or UNEP, stated that unless we radically curbed our emissions immediately, then by 2020 we'd go past the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase set as the lower limit by the Paris Agreement back in 2015. This draft UN report, due out later this year, says that if that happens, then it'll multiply global hunger, mass migration and conflict, as well as potentially setting some of the feedback loops around the globe into a non-reversible state. Here's a good summary from Jeremy Rifkin, economist and political advisor, and author of a book called The Third Industrial Revolution. And now we have so much CO2, methane and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere that it's blocking the sun's heat from getting off the earth. We are in real time climate change. This is no longer a theory. This is no longer looming on the horizon. This is no longer imminent. Climate change is now at the house in the door. So it looks like the time for debate is well and truly over. We need to get on with cutting through the morass of public and political inertia and stopping the freight train that's taken all of us very rapidly towards the edge of a cliff. That means rapid implementation of the new infrastructure that Jeremy Rifkin has developed with the European Union and which is already being rolled out to millions of homes to utilise renewable energy in a smart, integrated way across the globe. But it's becoming more and more clear that even that won't be enough. We will almost certainly now have to get to grips with how we can most efficiently remove some of the existing CO2 in our atmosphere. And that is a challenge that just at the moment, we don't have any built and proven technologies to achieve. We will, however, be looking at some of the upcoming ideas in future programs. Anyway, that's it for now. Please do share the link with as many people as possible and click the subscribe button and the notification bell, which if you're on a computer or a mobile device, I think is somewhere around about here. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.